hello everyone. Welcome to Doing Sociology. Uh, for today's session, we have with us uh, Dr. Gayatri Nair, uh, who will be talking to us on a very, very important topic, uh, which is literature review and citations. Uh, before we begin with the session, I'll very quickly introduce uh, Dr. Nair. Uh, she is an assistant professor of sociology at the Department of Social Sciences and Humanities in the Prasa Institute of Information Technology, Delhi. Her research interests lie in urban informal labor with an emphasis on the question of caste, gender, and technology. With a focus on political economy, she has published work that interrogates the role of caste and gender in shaping traditional livelihoods and new forms of work, specifically platform-based gig work also detailing how workers organize. This work has appeared in journals such as Contemporary South Asia, Journal of South Asian Development, and the Sociological Bulletin. Her recent book is Set Adrift, Capitalist Transformations and Community Politics Along Mumbai Shore, published by the Oxford University Press in 2021. Uh, very excited to have you with us today, Gayatri. And, uh, I think, you know, uh, this subject of, uh, you know, how to do uh, a review of literature and citations is often not, uh, you know, dealt with uh, in detail as much as it should. So uh, looking forward to this session. So over to you now. Thank you so much, Dipali. Thank you, Rituparna. I'm always uh, grateful to be, um, you know, find a space on doing sociology. I think this is very important work that's being done. Uh, and I'm glad I can contribute in a small way to this. So um, as has been sort of announced, the session is really on literature review and citations. Um, I've sort of organized this in thinking about what the process really looks like. So what does it mean to really engage in a, um, a literature review, starting from the point that where one has to really think about, um, you know, what, what is the kind of topic that one wants to work on, uh, how do you organize this and then how do you go on to write it? Um, so let me begin and I please let me know in case my slides are uh, not moving or something. Um, but let's begin by really trying to understand what the literature review is. Right? As an exercise, the literature review is really about presenting and as, as well as understanding for yourself or get, and getting a comprehensive overview over a certain domain of research that one has identified um, as being a domain of interest, right? So once you have identified this broader domain for yourself, um, you know, the literature review sort of helps you understand what might be the key issues, um, identify key ways of thinking, or in other words, uh, if you want to break that down a little bit more, to think about what are the kinds of analysis, what are the forms of arguments that emerge in the specific domain that we identify for ourselves. Right? And the literature review should really be thought of as the foundation for the kind of research that we want to conduct ahead. It is therefore impossible really to conceive of any kind of good research that has not in engaged in an uh, intensive form of a literature review. Right? Because in order to really uh, produce new work that we might see as important, as significant, uh, one must be familiar with what has preceded it. Right? Um, and therefore, a good literature review is really the first step and the first foundation in any kind of research exercise that we undertake. Now, very often, you know, when we study this as part of a research method courses that we do at uh, undergrad or postgraduate levels, uh, we're told that the entire point of the literature review exercise is to identify this gap in research where very neatly our uh, you know, research will now fit in and we will sort of plug the gap and, um, you know, we've sort of made the significant contribution to our field, right? Uh, and this can often be something that can stumble, uh, you know, any researcher. Uh, what if you don't find this large gap into which your research is now going to fit? So I think it's perhaps better and more fruitful to think about uh, the goal of the literature review, not really in necessarily identifying this large gap, though of course one may actually go on to find it, uh, but to also think of the other ways in which a literature review can provide direction for the research that we want to undertake, right? So this can be uh, in terms of identifying the need for more recent findings, so perhaps we notice that the literature review in the domain that we're uh, interested in is slightly dated and more recent work has not been conducted. So that might be the, find, the key sort of finding of your literature review. 
It could help you identify certain nuances, certain relationships that might have been understated or missing uh, in previous scholarship. And that is something that you can perhaps try and push forward with your own research. And it can also sometimes just be used in thinking about the application of a certain framework, of a certain method um, of analysis in a different context, right? So each of these are also further directions that one can take uh, existing scholarship in. Um, and so it's better to not just sort of get hung up on this notion of the big gap that the literature review is help, supposed to help us um, identify. Right. So in terms of first steps, what is it that one must do as a scholar who's approaching a literature review? Right? I think the biggest and most critical step is actually setting up and defining what is going to be the scope of your study. Right? There is, of course, some level of reading that is required in order to even arrive at what is uh, the scope of one's study. You must have a certain uh, a basic preliminary understanding of what is the kind of key readings that exist um, in that particular domain to arrive at what you think is the question that you want to focus on. I don't mean by this that one has identified the research question uh, you know, in, in its entirety, but that you arrive at a certain point of focus that you would wish to dig deeper into. Right? Uh, and this focus can be based on key findings uh, that have already emerged in the, in the field, uh, certain theoretical concerns, certain methodological differences, um, which you can set up as preliminary questions for yourself. Right? And the literature review that you will then conduct will actually help define and sharpen this area of focus a little bit more. Uh, it's also important at this stage to already be aware of certain preliminary perspectives, orientations or arguments that you might have, uh, particularly so as to be able to include counter arguments arguments, counter perspectives into the organization of your literature review, right? So you don't want to be uh, skewed at the get-go. You want to have as comprehensive as um, an understanding as possible, which would mean also engaging with differing perspectives from the one you have originally identified for yourself. And when we think about scope of point uh, and identify what might be the amount of literature that one really has to uh, and undertake, uh, you know, a study of for the research that you are doing. Now, this scope of study really comes down to thinking about what is the the form that your research is going to take. Right? If you are writing a term paper, it's going to be very different. If you are thinking of writing uh, a PhD thesis or an undergraduate dissertation, um, the scope of the study. So depending on the nature of this form of research itself, the, the form of the research output, so to speak, one would then uh, consider how much literature really has to be uh, undertaken as in the review process. Right? And of course, this is also going to be uh, related to the question of focus and the preliminary questions that you or objectives that you might have identified for yourself. So there is no set number that you, you know one must for a term paper you should have read ten uh, review ten journal articles or ten books or so on and so forth. Um, it is tied to this idea about getting a more comprehensive understanding and as comprehensive an understanding as you can related to the focus that you have set up. Uh, once this focus is identified, the next step is, of course, of building the collection, right? Uh, this is where you begin to look for key texts uh, by uh, identifying either based on your preliminary reading, you already know what are the key books or articles that one must consider uh, that are very well known in this particular domain or in this field, which you should actually look at. Um, you can use keywords, and this is a very helpful way to actually pinpoint us in the direction of particularly new writing. So use platforms like Google Scholar, use your library servers if you have access to these to actually locate sources um, and try different combinations of keywords and types of keywords, right? Uh, very often similar kinds of thematics can get clumped together. Uh, and so trying different kinds of combinations of keywords can actually lead you to entirely different uh, sources. Right? Once you have sort of begun this exercise of looking and uh, trying to find uh, sources for your 
literature review, you collect your relevant literature. And once you are collecting, right, as you are collecting, what you can also uh, undertake is a very brief exercise of looking at the literature review of the, the sources that you have identified. So where if it's a book, uh, perhaps the preliminary chapters, uh, if it's a journal article, you can identify the literature review section of it um, and look at what are the literature that has been referred to within these sections, right? And then of course, use the reference list that is provided uh, and the bibliography that is provided to further identify and find um, new sources to add to your collection, right? At this point, it's also important to actually begin to refine your search, right? So when you are going out collecting um, these sources, looking at different keywords, looking at reference lists and identifying what might work for you, it's also important to be able to uh, have a quick look at papers and books uh, and be able to summarize whether that literature is actually related to the focus uh, and the scope, right? And at this point, if you feel like it is only tangentially relevant, it's important to, uh, to be able to exercise that judgment to exclude it, right? So let's say you are interested in uh, something like urban processes and you are interested in um, more social economic processes. So let's say forms of work in urban areas. You may not be very interested in questions of political participation, which might also come up as you're looking for urban processes as your keyword. Uh, you can then exclude anything that comes up around questions of political participation, political processes, if it is not as, you know, in your defined scope of your study, right? Um, at this point, it is also necessary to start organizing your collection. And this is something I can't stress enough because um, over a period of time, you know, having transitioned myself from very haphazard ways of doing this to trying to be more organized, uh, I've realized the difference that it can make to your entire research process, right? The ease that it can come in when you are organized from the get-go itself. So whether this is about saving your uh, downloaded files, uh, you know, in a particular format, so ideally save it with the title, the name, you might want to add uh, you know, tags for this that will help you immediately be able to pull up uh, just by looking at the file name, what literature is relevant to you, right? You can devise your own style of doing this, but it's important to have a style to organize your collection, right? Uh, you can create different folders, um, you know, and, and, and sort of separate it uh, in the saving process itself, or if you collectively put it in one folder, then create titles, create tags, etc. Citation managers are incredibly useful in this process, right? And there are several free softwares um, that are available, Zotero, Mendeley, and Note Basic. Uh, you can quickly check, uh, you know, check out a YouTube video and tutorials. There are many of those as well that will run you through the process of how to use these citation managers. Uh, and these are quite useful both in terms of organizing uh, your collection because it allows for you to create different tags through which you can pull up relevant sources, but it's also useful during the process of citation. So while you're writing, um, these citation managers have certain built-in processes, you know, uh, through which you will be able to cite and pull up the relevant uh, literature quite easily, right? Um, so formatting and citation is an important aspect. And of course, we'll, we'll come back and, you know, towards the end, I will speak a little bit more uh, on that. Uh, but organizing and refining your collection is a very important critical step towards allowing you to do proper citations later on. Okay. Once this collection is more or less in place, right, then we begin really with the process of conducting the review. The conducting of a review really is not just about reading uh, the articles and the books that you might have put together, but also to be able to, you know, undertake a critical analysis of that literature. So one, when one is doing this, it's help, you know, useful to have certain kinds of questions uh, through which we look at this. Right? Uh, some of this, these questions could be built around what are the kinds of concepts that are used uh, in the literature, right? Particularly looking at uh, that domain, uh, you know, what are the key concepts that are invoked typically by different authors? What are the different theoretical frameworks uh, that are included, right? And what are the different methods that are used in terms of thinking about the research design 
uh, around literature in that particular domain, right? So we can think of this as a part of the, you know, review process where one is um, organizing the review now, right, towards not just in terms of building the logistics of, of organizing the review, but organizing our analysis of the review. So using these kinds of questions uh, in a very preliminary way can help us identify and set apart different kinds of readings that we have identified for ourselves. Right? Once we do this, there are a further set of questions that we can actually uh, pull up. So for each paper, each chapter or book that you are reading, uh, again, you know, you can build your notes by asking certain kinds of questions. For instance, what is the specific research question that is identified in that paper, right? And has the author addressed it, right? So you are not just looking to identify what the question is, but you are also making an evaluation of whether or not the authors have been uh, in a position to uh, answer and address the question that they have begun with. Right? Is the method or theory that has been used, so not just identify what is the theory that has been used, but has that particular method and theory, um, you know, been invoked in a way that has um, allowed for the research question to be answered, right? Then what are the main arguments really? And how does the author construct that argument? That is, one must be able to distinguish between what are the findings from a research and what are the analysis of this. Right? And this is fairly simple, particularly when we are looking at journal papers, where typically these sections actually come divided. So the authors are themselves writing in a prescribed format where the findings and the analysis are presented to us different, uh, you know, separately, distinctly. Um, but even in work or journal papers or books where this is not you know, done in this prescribed format, you should be able to delineate what are the key findings and what are the kinds of analysis or discussions that emerge out of looking at these findings, right? And how does the author then build a particular argument using these um, findings and, and uh, invoking concepts, invoking theories in order to make sense of it, right? Finally, you can evaluate the argument, right? You can make uh, a distinction between uh, you know, these works uh, and scholars, scholars who are able to corroborate their findings through their analysis, they are able to apply certain concepts that you think might have worked in order to be able to um, give meaning or make sense of the findings that are present. And perhaps you will also find a certain use of concepts or use of theories that do not really fit in with the findings or do not really fit in with the prescribed framework that has been identified at the outset by an author, right? So this is where your own analysis and your own evaluation is coming into play, right? So you are both trying to summarize what are the key arguments and key uh, methods, frameworks, etc., that are used, but you are also undertaking an analysis of this, right? And the reason that we have to build our notes or build our own analysis in this particular way at this stage is because when we are writing the review, right, uh, our own evaluation is what has to be highlighted more strongly. So when you are writing your review and when you are organizing your analysis, you should be able to build a link across the different kinds of works that you have read, right? You should be able to club together and identify what are some of the key emerging themes? What are some of the key emerging arguments, right? Um, how do they differ? How do they come together? Are they engaging with one another? Uh, particularly if there is some kind of debate unfolding, right? Then that is something that should be highlighted in the reviews writing process. So the literature review when we are seeing presents a comprehensive picture. The comprehensive picture is precisely around these kinds of questions questions about what are emerging themes and ideas, uh, what are the key ways in which these themes and ideas are actually put into uh, operation in each of these works, right? Finally, when we are thinking about writing the review itself, right, this is a very important uh, aspect of the review process. So it, one, I think one stage of it is where we build our extensive notes around what we are reading. Um, and some of the previous points that I mentioned about questions to ask are useful when you are making your notes um, and your own draft uh, of the literature review. But when you are writing up 
uh, the literature review section as, as a final version, right? At this point of time, it's important for us to be able to actually pull the strands together from our notes in order to provide uh, what appears as that comprehensive picture, which means that the literature review cannot be a summary of every book or article that we have read, right? So when we are writing this as well, we must be cautious of the fact that we are not writing our review as, you know, according to author X, and then we recap what author X has said, according to author Y, we recap what author Y has said, and then we try it and bring it into conversation with one another. That is one, a limited way to do your literature review, right? The ideal way in which we actually build a review is that instead of dividing different or summarizing each article or each book in either sentences or paragraphs, we actually build this around certain key themes that we identify, right? So based on our overall review and based on that kind of uh, analysis that we undertake where we are also evaluating what are the emergent ideas, we should be able to identify what are the key and significant themes that one must be familiar with in order to undertake research in this particular domain, right? I think it's useful also for us to think about the fact that when we are writing this literature review, we are also writing it for an audience. So the review process is also for our own understanding, but it is we can also imagine uh, how we might want to bring in and include a certain audience into our writing. So when someone is reading that literature review, if it is simple summarization, right, it is not entirely useful. One can go out and read abstracts and get a sense of what different authors are really saying on a particular subject. The idea of the review is really to be able to build uh, and develop a, uh, a, a sort of, uh, as I've mentioned before, comprehensive overview, which means that you are actually bringing different pieces into the conversation and the, the audience can, or, or the, or, you know, the readers are also able to get a sense of what you as this author of now this new research, how you are evaluating and making sense of this uh, existing scholarship in the field, right? So your review needs to be an analysis of this theme where your voice is also heard, right? And that comes through the kind of evaluative exercise that you undertake. Right? And you are uh, bringing together what might become both relevant questions. You might also identify certain things as, um, you know, having been resolved, no longer uh, particularly important, either, you know, owing to questions of time or um, maybe new emergent questions that have emerged. So therefore not so important, but the review process should help us identify that what really is at work in the domain that you have specified for yourself and the scope that you have specified for yourself, right? So it is through this evaluative exercise and by writing it, not as a summarization, but as an analysis of what are the key emergent ideas and themes that we then move on to this question of what are the gaps in research that really emerge. So towards the conclusion of your review, uh, of your literature review, you can therefore point in the direction of things that require further consideration, right? Perhaps deliberation over new concepts, new theoretical framings, new contexts, right? Within which this work has either been applied or not applied. And uh, th therefore you are indicating what might be the objectives and questions of the research that are to follow when you undertake with your specified work that you will undertake, right? Finally, let me conclude by speaking about citation practices, right? Um, of course, when we talk about citation practices, what we mean is that how are we really referencing authors? So you can see that, um, you know, even when you are writing the review process, this is something to be cognizant of. For instance, if you look at the point where, um, you know, point three, where uh, you are trying to build a conversation around, in your work around emergent themes, it might be more useful, right, to write this in your own words, not as a summary, but as an evaluation, and then cite the relevant literature that covers that particular theme 
through in-text citations, right? So once you have identified a theme, uh, there might be different elements of that theme and different ways in which it has been uh, discussed. You can club this together in terms of either methodological frame, uh, you know, uh, positioning or theoretical frameworks. And then through in-text citations, um, you identify all the work that actually refers to this particular way of looking at that theme, right? Uh, and the way in which this in-text citation has to be built has to follow a particular format. So we have multiple kinds of formats. We have uh, the APA, we have Chicago, uh, we have ASA, right? And usually if you are either writing, let's say on a particular software like Word, uh, or if you use citation managers, they will have settings that let you identify the particular format that you want to follow. There are, of course, those who prefer to do this more manually, right? Uh, and maybe write out a particular format uh, for themselves when they are doing both the in-text citation and the reference list. Um, that's perfectly fine. The only uh, uh, point that you might want to consider is that there should be consistency in one's formatting, right? Uh, this is something that one can often get a little mistaken about. So you might, you know, especially if you're doing it manually, there might be certain mistakes that uh, that come out here. And this is something that uh, will just lengthen your copy editing process, you know, when you are towards the final stages of your work. So using citation managers actually takes away what, you know, um, the problem and presents a sort of ease in the process because one can very quickly move between different citation styles. And that's also useful when you are thinking about, you know, uh, for instance, publishing this work. Very often, the first place that we send our work to may or may not, you know, it may or may not get accepted, right? And different journals, for instance, have different kind of citation styles that they follow. So using reference managers um, actually helps in this because if you are now submitting, let's say, a paper to a different journal or different venue, they have a different requirement for the citation style. By simple click of the button, you are able to switch the citation style throughout the paper, both in terms of the in-text citation as well as your final reference list, right? Obviously, if you're doing this manually, this, the process is linear. Um, so following a consistent style is important. Another thing that you can do here is that if you choose to actually manually do it and not use citation managers, uh, instead of writing it out, you can also actually go on to journal websites. Uh, this is also there for different publishers who are putting out books. They also have this, uh, sometimes have this uh, option available, where if you are looking up that particular article or that particular book, you might see a, a, a sort of button there which uh, says site, right, in inverted commas. And if you click on it, it allows you to switch between different styles and select the style that you want, copy the reference, and then uh, place it in your own text, right? Uh, but again, like I said, these are lengthier formats, but it requires you to kind of go online, look at different uh, journal websites, look at different um, publisher websites, and do this. So, Cite, I mean, I cannot recommend citation managers and reference managers enough because it really builds in an ease in this kind of process. Lastly, I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, of late there has been uh, a lot of relevant conversation around questions such as the politics of citation. Now, what does that really mean? It means that, you know, typically when one is undertaking a literature review and once you have identified this domain for yourself, we usually already have some indication or some sense of who are the key authors in a field, what are the key texts that we must refer to. And of course, it is important to bring and invoke these in. But it is also a fact that, you know, there are different kinds of reasons for why authors and scholarship from, uh, you know, of people belonging to either socially marginalized communities or socially marginalized locations, right, do not end up getting cited as often. So when you are building your literature review, when you are undertaking citations, it is important for you to be cognizant of new scholarship in the field. This is something that's uh, you know, often spoken about, but relatedly, when we are thinking about new scholarship in the field, um, it might also be useful for us to look at citation, try and integrate citations uh, of authors who are coming from different parts of the world. 
right? I think particularly for you know those of us working on questions, uh, social questions in India, uh, there is a lot that we can think about in terms of citing not just other authors from India, but also from the global south. Right? It might be more helpful for the, the social realities that we are considering to actually look at the literature that is emerging uh, from the global south rather than from the global north. And this is what we mean by the politics of citation, to be cognizant of it. Right, You don't have to do this as a necessity you know, uh, at each time. It may be relevant at certain uh, you know, in certain kind of work, it may not be so uh, important and relevant otherwise, but it is certainly helpful to be mindful of this so that we can keep this in mind um, when we are writing up our literature use. So I'll stop here with my presentation and take some question and answers about literature process. And thank you so much, Gayatri, for that brilliant uh, session. We already have a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, maybe okay. I could just read them out. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's a question by Vedika, who's asking how to check authenticity of articles on internet, uh, like Google Scholar. He's talking about that yeah. platform. Should I read the other two questions? And maybe you could take three at a time. Uh, OK, sure. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Uh, and then Saurabh is asking, uh, you know, what is the best way to know that the articles or books are relevant to uh, the topic of research? Uh, Priyanka's question is, is there an example to show of a paragraph that is a badly written literature review versus a well-written literature review? Okay, maybe we could begin with those three questions yes. and then... Uh, so let me begin uh, in the reverse order. Priyanka, I think that would have been very useful to highlight what is a badly written literature review, but I, did, I don't have anything immediately uh, on hand. But let me just put it this way, that a badly written literature review is a literature review that only summarizes texts. Because that is something, that is the biggest problem that one notices with a literature review, right? Where entire paragraphs are built around singular texts rather than actually bringing different texts into conversation with one another, right? And a well-written literature review would be one that can immediately pinpoint to you different elements that are there in a theme and also have the citations present right there so that as a reader, you are able to quickly cross-reference, right? So um, I hope that sort of answers your question. Then uh, sort of your question on what is the best way to know. So this is yeah a difficult uh, task, right? Because very often by when we are doing this, we are also hard pressed for time. It's not like we have a, the luxury of time to necessarily read things in its entirety. Um, so one useful thing is of course to read the abstract very closely. Right. This is something that authors pay close attention to because what we, uh, the author will typically do is uh, present in the abstract the key question that the work is considering, the key uh, method, uh, concept and framework. Right. A good abstract usually contains all of that. Um, so, of course, for a journal article, you can do that. For books, what is very helpful is to use, uh, read the introduction, because typically the introductory chapter will also give you an overview, uh, again, of the ways in which the, the findings and the analysis have been structured um, you know, and presented throughout. So, reading the abstract and the introduction. Even for a journal article, actually, you can do a quick read of the abstract because that is also, it will further help you identify whether actually that work is going to be useful or if it's only tangentially related and you need to uh, not consider it anymore. And the question on authenticity, um, Vedika's question, very, very important uh, question, Vedika. Now, one way to do this is usually, also, like you will typically, if you find something on Google Scholar, you will also go on the website and check the link. Um, it's a good idea to generally have a look at the journal website uh, and see what kind of um, articles they have previously published, you know, do a quick review of like the themes they cover. Um, and I think when you do that, you'll get a sense of, for instance, uh, whether, uh, you know, these are thematically organized or not, you will really be able to get a sense of whether this is scholarship that is um, you know, of a certain quality that you want to consider, right? Now, of course, one is one can also encounter journals in a domain that you are not familiar with at all, right? So in those scenarios, it's useful to look at things like whether they have listed 
um, you know, on their about page, really what kind of articles they consider, what kind of work they consider. Um, it's useful to also maybe if you want to do this very quickly, look at metrics like impact factor and things like that, which again give us an indication of the quality of a journal, right? Uh, so those are some of the kind uh, the ways in which you can do it. Uh, I do, don't think I need to state this, but it doesn't hurt that, of course, when one is saying that you are looking up sources, uh, you know, journal articles, books, etc., we mean academic sources, right? Uh, so even with undergraduate kind of research writing, etc., it's not useful to look at things like Wikipedia because, you know, I can very quickly go and change it. So it look, reads one thing today, it reads something else tomorrow. So it's not a good source to use, right? So we want... Ideally, uh, academic sources, particularly journals that have been through a peer review process, so that there is a certain quality of work that we can speak of. Yeah, uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, I think Varsha had a similar question uh, to what you've just answered about, you know, what are the sources to look up uh, besides Google Scholar and JSTOR? And uh, yeah. Yes. So, Sharon Lynn, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, has a very interesting question. Uh, you know, often what happens is when you start uh, doing your, you know, when you begin with your research, you read, uh, you know, a certain amount of literature. And by the time you're finishing your research, you, you know, a lot has been added. Uh, so, uh, the question is that... Uh, how does how does the literature review have to include research that has been published since you started your research or just the literature that you that was available when you were deciding your research questions no ideally this is something that it's a very good question Shannon, right like it's this is ideally something that you uh, keep at constantly so one is that of course you know when you are in the stages of um, and I imagine you are probably uh, talking more in terms of something like a PhD research right so one is one thing is that when you are in the stage of writing up your research proposal uh, you would have undertaken a comprehensive uh, review of the literature but as you're doing your field work or as maybe you are writing new literature keeps coming so in some ways, the expectation is that the literature review section of your work, right, at least till the point of final submission, is something that you can keep revisiting and reworking, right? So even new literature that comes in, uh, you should be able to find some place for it, account for it somewhere, right? Uh, both as an indication that you are keeping uh, an eye on what is the new emergent work in your field, right? Um, as well as to maybe incorporate certain insights that come from there, or if it is speaking to things that you are perhaps going to be arguing to, to then think through how you might want to uh, frame your own research to set it apart, right? Because you obviously do not want replication of work. So there is an expectation that one is always uh, reading throughout one's research process. And so at least till the point of time that you have submitted your work or, um, you know, you have published your work, you are able to try and uh, incorporate even newer literature that actually comes up right and uh the previous question which is on um, uh, looking at different journals where you may want to publish as well actually that's a really important uh, point to consider especially when you're thinking about more in terms of publishing your work right um this is something that you know i have anecdotally sort of heard i don't know whether you know how much this actually works or not uh, but it is useful particularly when you are uh, thinking about avenues of publication, right, and menus of publication that you look at the, the kind of uh, journals that you want to publish in, and you can also uh, incorporate some of the articles that have been published in that journal into your literature review, right? So I have heard, like I've said, anecdotally heard that this really helps uh, in the review process. But um, whether you view it in a very instrumental manner or not, I think what comes out is that it's uh, it, it indicates a certain kind of familiarity with the venue where you are choosing to publish. If that some thought has gone in on your part also in thinking about uh, that there is a good fit between your work and this particular journal. And so if you are able to also find that they have published work uh, in that domain previously, then that can ideally feature in your uh, literature review as well. Right. Uh, there are two, uh, there's one question on, uh, you know, the usefulness of uh, templates and frameworks like Prisma. Uh, so, 
this is Dipanita asking if there are alternatives uh, that are better to follow as compared to Prisma. And there are two questions on AI. Uh, one being how uh, artificial intelligence is going to impact uh, review of literature. And uh, so uh, Sabina is asking if, uh, you know, how authentic will our literature review be if we use tools like typeset? And uh, Disha has a question again related to AI, who's asking uh, how does uh, AI impact uh, literature review? And uh, yeah. Two yeah, questions. no, um, uh, these are really, I think, relevant questions for our times, right? Like, um, because it seems to simplify the entire process for us. Uh, so there are, I think, my central. Um, issue with the use of AI for um, writing a literature review. Uh, one is that, you know, I have two sort of points here. One would be that at this point of time, right, generative AI, for instance, is not necessarily producing uh, text through the most reliable sources, right? Uh, so we can, we often find, and, uh, you know, I know uh, a student of mine kind of tested this out as well of using, um, chat GPT to try and generate literature reviews and we were trying you know seeing how how well it did this and of course in some cases it works very well it can point you in the direction of new sources that perhaps you were not familiar with but one of the problems that has also been identified with generative AI tools has been that uh, they often uh, manufacture information right so it will even write you a little summary of a, of a book or an article that simply isn't in existence. So one cannot treat it as, a, you know, you cannot sort of hand over the responsibility of this literature review process to an AI text entirely uh, because of these problems of, you know, uh, incorrect information, et cetera, being present. But the second and important aspect that I think comes in over here is that what is really the point of the literature review exercise? right? Uh, writing it is one part of it, right? And perhaps, uh, you know, this also relates to the framework question. We can we can always kind of consider alternate frameworks, alternate ways in which we, we might want to present this work. But I think we should think of the literature review as a very integral process in our own uh, research exercise, right? Which is that it helps us understand something more and something deeper about that field. So surely, uh, you know, AI tools can write it up for you. Uh, but those are not the definitive ways in which it can be written because so much of this uh, re review process is essentially an exercise in analysis, right? It's not just about writing uh, it up. So if we think about it as an exercise in analysis, then it is something that you as a scholar should undertake, right? And this is why um, it may be useful in terms of maybe providing you indicators of style of writing, uh, you know, at, so at a at a very structural level of how to write it up, maybe there is some uh, perhaps in, you know, use of these tools, but really in order to think about it more um, integrally to the research process, I think it's more valuable that one should undertake this exercise uh, oneself, right? For citations, of course, like I said, you know, please make use of tools. But so, so wherever it is about a more formal kind of integration in terms of uh, the form of writing, tools and frameworks, etc., can be uh, you know toiled around with. But I think when we are thinking about what is the most substantive element of it, which is analysis, uh, I don't think we should you know take away our role as researchers from that. Thank you. Uh, Gayatri, uh, can we take a few more questions? Because, yes. or, yeah, okay. Uh, so I think there are three questions which uh, are to do with uh, how much should we read and, you know, what is there as an, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a number for, uh, you know, literature review. Uh, I think two questions, I like that. And uh, Abdullah's question is about, uh, uh, yeah, he's asking, is it necessary for a literature review to contain the objectives of the research? Uh, so broadly that and uh, yeah uh, and then how much literature should one review I i'm hesitant to give a number here a because i don't believe in it and b because i'm sure the recording will then be pulled up to uh you know point to different people and say look we've been told that you can read only five or ten so there is like i, I think i began by saying this there is no fixed number there is no ideal number right you can set this up in whatever way you want but what we what is the literature review about? It is 
to make sure that you are familiar and you are able to demonstrate this familiarity with the domain that you are interested in, right? So obviously, if the scope of your research is very narrow, let's say you're writing like a term paper, right? And it's only 2,000, 3,000 words. Obviously, one is not expecting, a, you know, a reference list that runs into like double figures or, you know, uh, because you are probably not going to have the scope to engage with any of uh, that kind of writing in a very central way. So you might pick up one or two key texts and might try and build your term paper around that. Right. Uh, of course, if you are looking at a more uh, extended form of a term paper, then the scope widens and then your ability to read more widens. So there is really no fixed number. I think what you can use as an indicator is to say, if this is my identified domain and this is my identified focus and scope, right? Do I have a good sense of what is already been you know established in this particular domain and in this within this scope? Um, do I have a sense of it and do I have a familiarity, right? Or is it the case that uh, I am actually maybe, uh, you know, I have read one thing and I have one perspective and one view on it, but I may not have a, a, a larger kind of engagement with other perspectives, right? So you, it, it's really a sort of um, qualitative judgment call that you have to make about your own familiarity and your ability to demonstrate that you have an understanding of that domain. That is what will determine how much you should read, right? Um, I do want to point to one other thing, which is that sometimes what we, uh, you know, or maybe this is something that only I do, uh, but when you are, especially when you have writing to do, right? The opposite problem can happen that we tend to read a lot more because we may want to procrastinate our writing process. So at a certain point, um, just as we are saying that, you know, the scope can be limited, um, by reading one or two, depending on what you're going, with very large uh, work, for instance, a PhD thesis, or if you're looking to write a book, right, the opposite problem of reading a lot and constantly reading can also happen. So at a certain point of time, again, you have to make a judgment call to say, okay, more or less whatever I have read seems to now, you know, be repeating itself as a certain saturation that one has reached. And so you can take a call about stopping your reading and maybe getting back to writing and not using reading as a way of procrastinating writing. Uh, and Abdullah's question, uh, sorry, can you please remind me? Uh, yeah, uh, so if one, uh, you know, if you one has to specify, you know, the objectives in the literature review or... Uh... Yes. So, uh, you know, ideally, your literature, by the end of your literature review, one should have an indication of where you are using this review to move with your own research, right? So it's not uh, necessarily that this needs to be incorporated within this section itself. Um, and again, these things really vary upon styles of writing, right? And if you don't have a very strong prescribed uh, format or style of doing this, um, for instance, if you're writing a, a book, right, you can play around with these kinds of things. Uh, and set it up in a way that you arrive at it, right? So you can either be doing it towards the end of your literature review, or maybe you are also indicating it throughout the literature review, like, in, you know, when you are summing up different thematics um, in that domain, you might sort of very quickly indicate that, okay, this, you know, this particular uh, uh, theory has not been uh, applied to look at this context, or, you know, there are new emergent conditions which require uh, further consideration under this framework, right? So you can either do that throughout the literature review or towards the end, right? But ideally, one must, uh, you know, having concluded the exercise of reviewing that literature and writing it up, one, the reader and you both should have a sense of where your research is moving, right? Keeping in mind the scholarship. So in that sense, both the objectives and your own questions should become a lot clearer at the end of the literature review exercise. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's still more questions there. Uh, happy but, to uh, take some more. Happy to take. Okay. So there are two questions on plagiarism. Uh, you know, uh, one being from Vaishali was asking how much plagiarism can be accepted. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, you yeah. can answer that. And there's a related question about, uh, you know, uh, this is Shishu who's asking uh, uh, that he's already worked on a project and is planning to use the same proposal for a PhD admission. So, you know, what happens in a situation like that if you use an unpublished work to submit elsewhere? Does that then turn into 
plagiarism. And maybe one last question was uh, from uh, Sri Radha, who's asking the best way to structure the literature review. So maybe you can close uh, today's very interesting session with these two questions. Sure. So um, on the the um, uh, I think the first question was around um, sorry uh, plagiarism, right? Plagiarism. And how yeah. much? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So of course, different uh, you know different institutions, different universities uh, will have their own. Um, you know, a kind of uh, established norm around what is an acceptable limit, right? And even uh, when we say acceptable, we mean like it's not that entire sections are reproduced, but this, that's usually kept in mind uh, for how these programs that help identify plagiarism are, um, are designed, right? So sometimes they might work on the logic of a string of words together uh, being highlighted as an instance of plagiarism, but it could also be a very commonly used string of words which is why we usually say that, you know, a certain percentage is acceptable, right? So the, the specifics of that might vary. Uh, in some places, it can be 20%. In some places, it can be 10%. Um, you know, and some, some might also say just zero plagiarism. But a lot of that comes down to really institutional norms, uh, as well as a specific kind of um, software and tool that is being used to identify I think as a rule of thumb, what you should be going for is that uh, you should, I mean, the entire exercise is really, if we are thinking about it as the foundation of our research, then we should be able to credit uh, authors and scholars where they have done that kind of work, right? So whether we are paraphrasing arguments or whether we are um, summarizing arguments, you can always make use of in-text citations to make sure that you are not engaging in any kind of plagiarism, right? Um, and it is that it's really an ethical practice to be able to credit um, previous scholarship where it has actually come, right? Uh, I think Google Scholar has that line that says, uh, standing on the shoulder of giants, which really is indicative of the fact that our research is not, you know, it doesn't just spring up out of nowhere. We are really building it on what has come before and therefore uh, citation, therefore credit, uh, is required. So the specificities of um, how much is accepted or not uh, aside, this is something that as an ethical practice of research, uh, one should really keep in mind. Um, how should we structure the literature review? So like I said, ideally, you should be structuring it thematically. Now, what those themes are will obviously differ from uh, research to research, focus, you know, specific focus of each domain of uh, literature also will kind of vary, right? Uh, but the best kind of literature reviews that one reads are those where this overview is provided thematically, right? And within each thematic, they are able to identify, uh, let's say you are interested in the question of uh, the intersections of gender and uh, 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 like work, right? So some of the key thematics for you might be um, what are the particular ways in which um, certain forms of labor have been identified uh, as undergoing a feminization process, right? So you are not, again, summarizing each article, but through your in-text references, you will be pointing out to the fact that there was an entire, uh, you know, a historical period, there were certain kinds of work that were clubbed under this framework of feminization of uh, work, right? And so you will unpack what that means, uh, and you will bring in your different, uh, the different scholars you've read to build that particular thematic. So, and then you can move from one thematic to another, right? Ideally, when you are writing this literature review, you should also simply, because of ease of readership, right? You should also have some kind of flow that comes into your writing. So each thematic should kind of build up towards the next thematic that you want to move into, right? So as you're writing up, let's say, uh, you are concluding the discussion on one theme that you have identified, maybe you can introduce right into the, the last few sentences uh, its connection with the next major theme that you want to look at and, and so on and so forth to provide this kind of narrative flow to your literature review as well. I think there was one more question. Yes, 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 there was one more question from Vanshika and I missed it. And uh, she's asking, what is the best way to keep up with new literature in your that is, research? Yeah, that is a hard one. Uh, and you will typically find that no matter how much you are trying to keep up on top of it, there are things that you have missed. 
uh, but there are different ways you can do this, right? Some of the easy uh, ways to do this is that um, Google Scholar, for instance, lets you set up alerts. So you can put in a list of keywords that you are interested in, um, you know, related to your literature, and you will be sent an email each time a new article comes up, right? So that's a very simple kind of tool that you can use. The other and perhaps a better way to do it, I think, is to frequent the pages of journals that you are uh, that are related to your particular theme and see what is the kind of writing that is coming up here, right? And this is, I think, also good because um, at preliminary stages of research, one also wants to read a little bit more widely rather than just very focused and directly linked to one's own research. Even though the when you are sitting down to do your literature review, I think I had mentioned that you might have to exclude certain literature that you see as tangentially related, right? I think any good researcher would uh, require a broader understanding of their field as well. So, you know, going through these different pages, going through visiting the home pages of different journals, um, keeping up with what is the, the latest kind of work coming up over there is also a good uh, indicator, right? But having said that, uh, there is always going to be the possibility of missing key literature, right? So you should always also be prepared for that. Uh, you know, sometimes your reviewers uh, will point this out to you, your examiners, your, uh, your supervisors may indicate this to you. But despite all of these, there can still be things that you miss, uh, especially when it comes out, you know, perhaps at, to one, at a point where you think you've closed your literature review, you know, new work coming up can often be missed. Uh, so those possibilities are always there. Uh, and, and But one is just trying to do one's uh, best as you can go on with this. Right. right. I think, uh, you know, you've answered all the questions. Uh, yeah. I okay. hope I've not missed any questions. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Gayatri, for taking time out and joining us today. And I mean, I think all the participants today uh, would agree that this was indeed a very, very uh, insightful conversation. So thank you so much. And uh, I really hope uh, our uh, participants, yeah, have taken a lot from this uh, session. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being here so patiently, uh, you know, love weekday evening not the easiest time so thank you for being here